Okay. So if we start out by thinking about the sensory systems, we first wanna think about differentiating sensing and sensation, okay? Two similar words, but two very different concepts. So when you think about sensing, it's basically just the detection of a stimulus, okay? If you put your hand near a hot stove, you'll be able to detect the temperature of that stove. And that's basically a sensory um, or sensing. Now it doesn't require any perception, it doesn't require any conscious appreciation of that sensory stimulus. So this is where we want to think about sensation. Sensation is the conscious perception of detecting sensory stimuli. Okay. So in some cases we can sense things which will automatically result in sensation. And then in some cases, we can have sensory perceptions um, that are not necessarily going to the brain and we're not necessarily having a conscious appreciation of that. Now, in terms of our senses, there are three distinct groups. We've got visceral senses, which are only um, just basically detection of stimuli, doesn't involve any sensation. We have somatic senses, which produces sensations through uncomplicated mechanism. So when you think about somatic, think about proprioception, think about touch, and proprioception is your joint position. Um, think about touch, think about temperature, those are gonna be somatic senses. Um, and then if we think about special senses, these produce sensation through much more complex mechanisms. So it's not as simple as perceiving temperature or perceiving touch, but it's gonna be a much more complex a series of reactions that brings about that sensation. And this is where we describe our special senses. So our vision, our vision is not just looking at something and uh, it's not a, a simple mechanism. It's much more complex for us to put meaning to the things that we are actually visualizing. Okay, same thing goes for taste or our gustatory uh, perception. Then there's um, smell, which is our olfactory perception. Um, and then, you know, we also have, um, yeah, so those are our five senses. Now, although we typically divide these and we think about them in separate ways, there really is integration happening in that sensory information. So for example, if I'm looking at a movie, okay, I will typically divide what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. But in the brain, there is actually um, complex integration that's happening between our visual perception, auditory perception, perhaps even our olfactory perception. And this is where we can start to really think about um, memories and how those are heavily integrated. All right, now how does sensation work? So a stimulus is presented. This is basically some type of change that is detected in our environment. Maybe um, something is moving, maybe there's something touching against you, uh, maybe you're hearing a sound in the background. So that is just basically a change in the environment. That is your stimulus. A structure, a sensory receptor, is going to detect that change and it's going to convert it into some type of electrical energy or signal. Again, thinking about images perceived onto our retina. Those are then converted into electrical signals, which are uh, picked up by our um, optic nerves and then transfer to relevant areas in the brain where we can make sense of those images. So it's beyond just that physical perception. There are uh, uh, conscientious uh, procreation happening of those images in other parts of the brain. So that signal is taken by neurons to other areas in the brain. The brain integrates that. Okay, so it's not perceived in a silo, it's really integrated with everything else that we are perceiving, um, and then we can make sense of that image. And so that'll be a really good example of just seeing something, which is a stimulus or a sensing, and sensation, which is actually perceiving the image, making meaning from the image, even creating memories from those images. All right, let's talk about adaptation. So adaptation is a decrease in the signal strength that is generated by the receptor during prolonged steady state stimulation, okay? So basically the, um, the strength of the signal somewhat dissipates over time. And that is what we refer to as adaptation. 
Um, so the signal strength can fade, especially if there's constant stimulation, so that the strength of that signal is not perceived in the same way as it would on the first, um, the first instance of that perception, for example. And I'll give you another example of this. So let's say you've, um, you have hot water and you put your hand into that hot water, immediately that's gonna feel uh, very hot. You know, it's gonna be a drastic temperature difference to your internal temperature. And so the immediate signal of that, um, that stimulus is going to be quite drastic. Whereas if you left your hand in that same temperature of water, it's almost as if the temperature becomes cooler, but that isn't true. What's happening is adaptation. Your um, sensors, your receptors on your hand, your temperature receptors are actually going to adapt to that temperature. And so it will appear as if that signal strength is fading. Okay, now some sensors can adapt more quickly than others. So touch, smell sensors adapt quite quickly, whereas pain and proprioceptive sensors adapt much more slowly. Okay, now let's begin by talking about vision. And although we're really only focusing on anatomy structures and your exam and quizzes will only focus on the identification of these structures, I think it's extremely important to talk about their function. The understanding the function of these structures will really help you just to give more meaning to these structures and perhaps just make it a little bit easier to remember them and recall them. So we will speak about vision and we will speak about the process of detecting light and we'll speak about the function of each of the structures really as a way to add some meaning to all of the structures of the eye that we will describe. So we detect light into the eye and then that light is integrated into our conscious perception really by transferring those images or light onto certain areas of the brain, all right? So basically our eyes are the organs into, you know, that, that basically control the entrance of light into the eyes. Uh, into the into the brain really, and so we have certain receptors on the eye that on the eye that can specifically detect light. These are called photoreceptors, and then these will connect to other areas of the brain. This is called a visual pathway. All right. If you happen to go into medical school or maybe into graduate school, you'll have to learn tracks, very complex tracks that control um, this pathway. But as for our purposes, we're really focusing on, on the structures of the eye and not so much of the visual tracks that relay these light and these images to different parts of the brain. So let's begin by talking about the lacrimal apparatus. This is basically the structures in and around the eye that are responsible for generation of tears, movement of tears, and then the absorption of tears. So essentially, the function of the lacrimal apparatus is for keeping the eyes clean, keeping them sanitary, removing any dirt, debris, pathogens, um, you know, any bacteria that could be uh, introduced to the eye from our environment, from our hands, especially for those of us who like to rub the eyes, particularly during allergy season. Um, so the lacrimal apparatus helps to create tears that help to wash those um, particles towards the inner ear where they can be reabsorbed um, and then eventually producing mucus, which can be swallowed, okay? Doesn't sound very cool, but that's kind of the whole mechanism. So the lacrimal apparatus starts with the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal gland is actually in the upper outer quadrant of the eye. So here's our lacrimal gland, okay? It's gonna have two portions to it. It's gonna have the orbital part that is somewhat above, the levator palpable brain muscle, we'll talk about this muscle coming up, and then it has a deeper palpable part, which is beneath that levator palpable brain muscle. Both of these components of the gland basically produce tears. They produce secretions, which can um, wash onto the surface of the sclera and the anterior aspect of the eye, and then eventually move towards the inner eye. Okay, well, we'll talk about the other parts of the lacrimal apparatus. 
So it's going to pass from lateral to medial and move towards some of the more medial structures. So first it's going to enter the superior and inferior puncta, right? So these are basically openings in the medial surface of the eye. And these openings are where those secretions can be absorbed. So some of them will fall onto your face, obviously, if it's more of like an emotional, um, you know, you're actually crying, which is a deeper emotional function. Um, but if it's just the production of tears to remove debris, most of that typically gets reabsorbed into the medial aspect. So reabsorbed into the puncta, and then from there, it's gonna go into the superior and inferior canaliculi. And canaliculi are basically channels or passageways all right, so here's this um, horizontal structure, the superior canaliculus, and then the inferior structure here, the inferior canaliculus. And these help to just drain the tears that are reabsorbed into the puncta. From there, they go to the lacrimal sac, which is this large structure here, and that is connected to the nasal lacrimal duct, which drains down into the nasal cavity, all right? So we create tears, they wash across the eye, absorbed into the puncta, which are the openings, drained it through the, lacrym the lacrimal canaliculi, which are the channels, so to speak, and then they go into the sac, which is a larger storage structure um, for those secretions, and then down through the laser nasal lacrimal duct into the inferior nasal concha, which is in the nasal cavity. So this is where we can swallow. If you've ever been crying or had allergies, you typically also get pretty snuffly um, or stuffy. And that is the result of those secretions draining into the nasal cavity. Okay, let's move on to speak about the eye muscles, specifically the extrinsic eye muscles. And these are responsible for moving the eyeball itself in different directions and really helping us to um, taking a larger range of view, taking a larger uh, orbital, uh, orbital field so that we can see multiple different views. Okay, this is how we get peripheral vision, and this is how we can look up, down, etc. So there is superior rectus. So superior rectus is above the eye. Okay, it's right on top. And I've not included the levator palpebrae superioris. That is a muscle that exists above the eyeball itself. That's the one we described in reference to the lacrimal gland. That doesn't move the eyeball, that actually moves the eyelid. So that's gonna help with um, opening and closing of the eyelid and not so much moving of the eyeball itself. But under that muscle, we will encounter the superior rectus muscle. At the bottom of the eye is the inferior rectus muscle, um, also moving in a, a straight direction or rectus in this case. Lateral rectus is on the lateral aspect of the eyeball. Medial rectus is on the medial aspect of the eyeball. And then we have some oblique muscles. These are um, oblique in their orientation, but also oblique in the way that they move the eyeball. So we have the superior oblique, which is a pulley-like muscle. It is connected to an anchoring portion, and it has these fibrous tendinous connections that give it an oblique orientation, right? It's kind of a pulley. And then at the bottom is the inferior oblique, also in an oblique uh, position, and that will also help to move the eye in an oblique uh, orientation as well. So we have four rectus muscles, which are moving the eye in a straight direction, superior rectus moving it up, inferior rectus down, lateral rectus lateral, medial rectus medial, and then our oblique muscles, superior oblique, moving the eyes uh, down and out, inferior oblique, moving the eyes up and up. And then here's a different view. Here's a superior view of these muscles where we can see superior oblique much more clearly. Notice levator palpebrae superioris is cut here, but that is actually found running above superior rectus. And then that is found running above the superior oblique. Let's move on to some of the more internal structures of the eye and then their functions. So if we look into someone's eye, the first thing that we probably perceive is the color of their eyes, particularly if it's a more striking color. So the iris is what gives the color to anyone's eye, right? It's what creates the colored portion of the eye. So here's the iris, 
of the eye. Inside of that is the pupil. So the pupil is really an open space that allows light to enter the eye. And so it typically appears black. The pupil is also going to be a good indicator of, um, of um, alertness. It can be an indicator of someone's um, responsiveness. So typically when you shine light into the pupils, they should constrict as a nat natural a response or a reaction. And so this can give us uh, um, an idea of how alert and responsive someone is. It can also give us an idea of brain function. So this is how we can tell if someone is comatose by shining light into their eyes. Moving on, we could think about the outer fibrous layer of the eye being the um, cornea and sclera. So the cornea is going to be the anterior covering of the eye. Here's the cornea here. And then the extension of the cornea is going to go right around the eye, and it's going to be called a sclera. And it's kind of colored um, pink in this uh, image, but it really is white, especially on gross um, inspection, just looking at the eyes closely. So this is the cornea, and then this is the sclera. And these are going to be the outer, again, fibrous, thicker, more protective layers of the eye. Deep to that is going to be a vascular layer. So the vascular layer is going to have blood vessels, it's going to have some small nerves, it's going to have some um, yeah, veins and arteries. And this is going to be different depending on different um, parts of the eye. So the choroid layer is going to be the area that's deep to the sclera. So here's the choroid layer. And notice in this image, it's showing us tiny red and blue spots. This is really depicting small capillaries and small um, blood vessels um, that are found in this layer. This is the layer that nourishes the eyeball, providing nutrients and oxygen. And then deep to that, we'll have the inner layer, which is the retina. So the retina is this yellow layer, which is our sensory layer. And this is where we can perceive the light that is being projected into the eye. Okay. Now, as far as the vascular layer, the portion of that that is found anterior, so not the choroid layer that's found deep to the sclera, but we do have the ciliary body, which are these smooth muscle structures here, and then we do have the iris internally as well, and these are going to be the vascular layer of the anterior part of the eye. Okay, these are the portions that are deep to the, the, uh, the cornea. So here is the iris. And remember, from a anterior view, this is the part that gives the color to the eye. So the iris, and that is connected to the ciliary bodies. Now, going back to the retina a bit, the retina is directly connected to the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. And that is going to be how we perceive vision um, by perception of light onto that nerve and then um, the transferring of that to certain other parts of the brain. And then the specific part of the retina onto which light focuses is called the fovea centralis. So here's our fovea centralis which is really where that light can focus. And so the whole reason for having the lens, the cornea, the iris is to focus that light. So as light comes in, the pupil, which is the open space for that light to travel, starts to focus that light into a smaller area. And then the lens helps to um, either um, a change its shape or size so that that light can focus directly onto the spot and we can perceive that light. So um, just going back to what we said earlier, the cornea and sclera are actually connected. They're connected. They are that fibrous layer. The cornea is the anterior portion. And it's really uh, to allow for a transparent area at the anterior part of the eye. So the sclera is not transparent, but the cornea is. And again, thinking back to that function of light um, being focused onto the retina, the cornea has to be transparent in order to let that light through. If we get into that middle layer of um, the vascular layer here, this is what we refer to as the uvea. And so that is going to have different components in different parts of the eye. So that uvea in the uh, 
outer portions of the eye deep to the sclera, that's gonna have the choroid layer, which we described earlier. And then if we're looking at the anterior part of the eye, that's gonna have the ciliary body, um, also referred to as the ciliary muscle, because that's a smooth muscle that can help to change the shape of the lens, as well as the iris. Okay, so getting more into the choroid and the ciliary body. So the choroid we said covers the posterior three fourths of the eye. It's gonna be uh, pigmented uh, due to melanin present in this layer, but also just due to the capillaries and blood vessels that are present here. So here's that choroid layer. Okay, got this has lots of um, arteries and veins just to help nourish the sclera and the eye. And then the ciliary body is going to be a ring of tissue that encircles the lens. So up here, we can see the ciliary body. And that is basically helping to control the shape of the lens. Notice that it's actually attached to the lens here. Uh, and that is not to be confused with the iris. The iris is actually going to be above or superficial to the lens. OK, that's going to help create that open area of the pupil. But the lens itself is going to either be convex or concave. It can change its shape depending on whether or not the ciliary body muscles are relaxed or contracted. And then just looking at this image down here, we can see those structures as well. So here is our cornea. Here are our ciliary muscles. Notice that they are attached to the lens. Here's the lens. Here is the pupil, which is the open space that allows light to enter. And then here is the iris, which is creating the color of the eyes. Okay, uh, let's take another look or a different perspective here of the iris. So here's the iris, and the iris also has the ability um, to change, uh, to relax or contract, to change its shape. This is what controls the size of the pupil. So the pupil being that open space, if we relax the iris, then we make the pupil larger. And if we contract the iris, then we make the pupil smaller. Um, and again, this can help um, give us an idea about deeper brain functions and again, our uh, arousal, our state of arousal. Let's talk about the retina. So the retina is inside the eyeball, right? So this internal layer here in yellow, it is a sensory structure. So it's basically made of neurons. It's about 10 layers. Um, and three of those layers are made of neurons. And these neurons contain what we call photoreceptors, which are responsible for detecting light. So the aim of the game here, again, is to focus light onto the fovea centralis. This is where we're trying to direct that light to. And so we change the size of the pupil, we change the shape of the lens in order to bring that light directly onto this spot. Once light is hitting this spot, then the nerve endings or the axons that form the optic nerve can pick up that light using those photoreceptors and can conduct those um, messages as uh, electrical signals on the optic nerve to other parts of the brain. All right. Now we must talk about the blind spot and we must also talk about the sharpness and the acuity of vision, because this is where we can get into some of our visual disturbances and some of our um, different types of um, you know, defects with, with regard to vision. So the optic nerve actually has to pierce that sensory layer. So it has to leave the eye. And as it does so, it forms what's called the optic disc. So here is where the optic nerve actually has to pierce the eye and then continue on to create the optic tract and so on and so forth. So the area where the optic nerve pierces the eye, there's no perception of vision on that spot. That is referred to as the blind spot, okay? And so there are different exercises that we can use to find our blind spot, but essentially this is that one spot on the retina where there is no perception of vision and where we're not able to perceive any light that's hitting that spot, okay? Now, in order for us to get the sharpest vision, 
um, we must focus that light directly onto the center of the retina. Okay, this is the area of the retina where we describe the fovea centralis. Um, and it's basically the center of another region that's called the macula. Okay, um, so we have to focus the light directly onto the spot. If the light focuses too um, before that spot, this is what we refer to as nearsightedness. Uh, if the light focuses beyond that spot, so too far away, this is what we refer to as farsightedness. So depending on um, visual disturbances of the lens, right, this can lead to blurry visions when we try to look at images that are close up to us or blurry visions when you try to look at images that are far away. So this is where we typically need to have corrective lenses. This is why some folks wear glasses like myself. Um, and this can help us to adjust the way that that light is being focused to get it directly onto that fovea centralis. And it can be a corrective mechanism for any type of visual uh, disturbance. Now let's talk about the lens in regard to the chambers of the eye. So the lens is that flattened circle. Here's the lens. And that helps to basically divide the eye into two different chambers. Everything that is anterior to the iris is gonna be the anterior chamber. And everything that is between the iris and the lens is gonna be the posterior chamber, okay? So basically we can think about these two chambers as spaces um, where we have um, the separation regarding these different structures. So anterior chamber uh, is anterior to the lens, posterior to the cornea, posterior chamber is posterior to the lens, anterior to the, excuse me, posterior to the iris, anterior to the lens. So this really tiny space in between the lens and the iris. Right. We also want to think about the vitreous body. So the vitreous body is a clear jelly-like substance that basically keeps the eye open, keeps the eyeball patent. Um, and it's mainly made of water, but it has other electrolytes and other um, glycoproteins, et cetera, in it. But basically, it's a, it's a substance to keep the eyeball open and, um, and patent. And so uh, what's really cool is to look at the cadaver eyes. So if you look at a cadaver eye, because of the way that we sometimes dissect the skull, the eye gets cut and most of that vitreous body or vitreous humor will actually leak out. And you'll see the eyeball actually begin to compress on itself, almost like a beach ball that's been deflated. So it's really important to have this jelly-like substance to help keep the eyeball open and patent. All right, which we know is really important to the function of letting that light in to hit those um, those sensory areas at the, the back at the retina. 